Florida Atheist Studio in Tampa. This is the Atheist Forum, a production of Florida Atheists Incorporated. Join us now for a special presentation of Jerry DeWitt. Now here's the host of the Atheist Forum, Jim Peterson. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to have so many of you here. And uh, we're going to have a really interesting time tonight because we are very pleased to have with us a very distinguished gentleman who has had an extraordinary journey. He, um, he is from De Ritter, Louisiana, where he was the pastor of a, of a local church. And he came to uh, a genuine insight into the nature of his own humanity and that of others. A, an insight which he now shares nationwide with others to help them make similar discoveries. Uh, his struggle for identity and meaning mirrors the one currently facing millions of people around the world. With both agnosticism and atheism entering the mainstream, one in five Americans now claim no religious affiliation according to a recent study. The moment has arrived for a new atheist voice one that is respectful of faith and religious traditions, yet warmly embraces a life free of religion, finding not skepticism and cold doubt, but rather prefer a profound meaning and hope. And it is that profound meaning we hope to hear about tonight. And so uh, let me introduce Jerry DeWitt. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'll, I'll start off very similar to most of my other meetings. How many know why I'm here? How many know my story? A little bit, just about everybody? Okay, well, what I have found is, is that um, in the Q&A session, in the answers, I'm more likely to give a detailed explanation of how everything came about than what I can in just giving a presentation. Is that too loud? Does that sound too, is that good? And so, uh, so I'll talk for just a minute and then open it up for Q&A. So be thinking about what your questions are. But what I would like to do is kind of set you up for your next big meeting when you're going to host uh, for, uh, the philosopher Daniel Dennett. And the reason that's important to me is because unbeknownst to me, as I was making my way out of religion and working my way out of faith, I didn't know that at the same time there were some very prominent people within the secular movement whose hearts were being greatly motivated by compassion. And the particular group of people they were compassionate for were people like myself, people who had moved into non-belief but felt as if they were still trapped in ministry or trapped in another identity. And so what you're going to find out surely when Daniel Dennett gets here, and I would also suggest that you go to Amazon and you buy Quitting the Pulpit, which is the latest book by Daniel Dennett and researcher Linda Lascola, in that book you will find the history of the clergy project and why it is important to people in my particular position, or at least the position that I'm thankful to say I once was in and now I'm not there anymore. So how does a person after 42 years of not only 25 years of being in the ministry but 42 years of being very embedded in a religious community how do you come out of that? What's the circumstances that brings a person to that? And so once again, referencing to Daniel Dennett that would be here uh, in a couple of weeks, I would like to go over the five stages. Now, I hope you can bear with me because one of the other things that I promote while I'm, while I'm out talking is the complexity of this situation. That is just not that simple. And since I'm at the end of not only my book tour, but also at the end of my touring experience, I'm getting more and more liberal about the things that I'm no longer afraid to say and what I'm willing to say out on the video. And so what I've been saying recently is that if we continue to think that we can somehow in a three minute YouTube video capture everything that's important and make our argument so concisely that within three minutes everyone should be deconverted, then we're fooling ourselves. Because life is just much more complicated than that. And so I can, I can break my progress down into five easy steps. But you have to appreciate with me that they overlapped greatly. And some of the steps took many, many years. And some steps came much more quickly. 
But the reason I like to brag about these five steps is because when I got up and I spoke about them at the American Atheist Convention immediately after the Reason Rally, um, philosopher Daniel Dennett heard those five steps and then used that in his presentation whenever he spoke to the Global Atheist in Australia last year. And so that was, that was a big success for me, that here was Daniel Dennett, this great well-known author, and, and I actually used it as my Facebook cover and I posted it as my profile picture at different times because he stood on this massive stage and he had my five steps listed. Now, you have to appreciate that, that I literally came out of the southern dirt of nothingness, right? No education, no great economy, no uh, family of any notoriety, just literally out of nothing. But yet here in Australia on this huge screen was a slide of Daniel Dennett's presentation and it not only had my five steps, it had my name on it. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Now, of course, life always has a way of balancing things out, right? And so he spelt my name wrong. <laughs> but since then, because it's Daniel Dennett, I've been thinking about going to court and maybe getting it changed, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, he just didn't capitalize the W as anybody should know to do, but it's okay. But these five steps. Now, the first step seems as if it would be obvious, and it seems as if, when I tell you what the first step is, it seems as if that this is really all you really hear out of mainstream Christianity. The first step was, was that I become to believe that God really does love everybody. And that shouldn't seem like it's a transitional moment in a Christian's life. But if you back up with me just a little bit, you'll see that I came from a version of Christianity called Pentecostalism that though we would say, well, sure, God loves everybody, in reality, we would promote a doctrine that though God was supposed to love everyone, he really only wanted to live forever with just a very, very slim few, <laughs> right? And he was perfectly okay with the rest going to hell for all of eternity. Well, what caused my internal dilemma was this precious lady in my life, my grandmother. And my grandmother displayed all of my life what many Christians would refer to as a, a Christ-like attitude, a Christ-like spirit. She was completely and totally the embodiment of compassion and empathy. And time after time as I grew up, I would see people come sit at our kitchen table and if there was no one else in the world who could put up with somebody's stupid crap, my grandmother could. And time after time, I would see the rest of the family slowly sitting around the table with my grandmother and whoever it was that had their soul to unburden. I would see that moment of registry where people would realize, this, this is pretty stupid. You know, this, this isn't going to get any better. You know, this person is their own worst enemy. And they would slowly excuse themselves and back away from the table until all that would be left would be my loving grandmother who would patiently would have sat there until the person dehydrated and passed out. And that was God to me. That was what God would look like. That's what God would act like if God was a grandmother. And that impressed me. That, that gave me this standard in my heart that I would then try to base everything else on. And so, when I'm 17 years of age, I got saved at Jimmy Swaggart's church down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. <clears throat> wow! That's a different response. I normally get a, something like, you know, sneers and giggles, but that was pretty cool. All right, all right, so go Swaggers. Um, and, and so I get saved at Jimmy Swaggers Church at the age of 16, and by 17, I'm full-fledged in the ministry. Now, when it became my responsibility to teach the doctrine of eternal punishment, to talk about hell and how easy it is to get there if you're a Pentecostal, I had problems with that. I struggled with that because, keep in mind, my vision of God was somewhat closer to my grandmother and her beautiful disposition than it was the God that was being translated to me through this doctrine. And from the very beginning, I struggled with the idea that God, with his ability to know all things, would still yet in advance create hell. And of course, Christian apologetics would quickly tell you he did not create it for humans. He created it for the devil. But humans go there by their own free will. You could still not create it. 
you could still do something better. You could still do something different. And so almost immediately in my ministerial experience, I was challenged with this idea. And quoting Mike Williams from the Gospel Revolution out of Houston, Texas, I began to sense that my heart was kinder than my doctrine. That's a problem <laughs> when you're supposed to be preaching that doctrine. So somewhat in secret, as early as the age of 17, 18, I began to read things I was not supposed to read. Now, of course, nothing as severe as, you know, the God delusion or, or you know, letters to a Christian nation, but to read theological discourses by ministers that did not fit within our box, that did not belong to our tribe. And it began to challenge my way of thinking. So the next phase was, as I began to to study these other ways of looking at Christianity and the other ways of looking at even the crucifixion of Christ, what was actually accomplished in God's mind when Christ was crucified, I stumbled across these beautiful people called universalists. People that believe that everybody goes to heaven. And there's different types of universalists. There's some that may be a little bit more kin to, to how the UUs came into being that believe that all forms of religion ultimately take you to God, right? As if it's a very spider web of a map and all leads to the center of town. But then there's other universalists that believe that what Christ did on the cross was so significant and so complete that it paid for the sins of all of humanity. Not just the sins individually, not just the times that you honked at somebody in town because they didn't leave the red light as soon as you thought they would. Yes, if you're devout, that should be considered a sin, right? But the sin of unbelief, that one large sin that was committed by Adam and was transferred to all of the human race. And so there's people that believed that that one sin was completely paid for and everybody was going to go to heaven. That sounded better to me. That fit my personality a little bit better. Because when I was standing behind the pulpit, there was a lot of things that I could be egotistical about, but I knew in my heart of hearts that I wasn't any better than the people sitting out in the pews. And so this idea of universalism was stage two. Not only did God love everyone, but I come to believe that God saves everyone. Now, the, the form of Pentecostalism that I grew up in believed in speaking in other tongues. Has anybody had that experience? You're all going to hell. Oh, two have. All right, so the three of us, we got it made. So <clears throat> within, this, within this doctrine is this idea and this acknowledgement that the Holy Spirit, or as we would refer to it as the Holy Ghost, right? People who said Holy Spirit were playing around. If you were serious, you'd say Holy Ghost because that was King James. Um, that, that the Holy Ghost being invisible, there had to be some evidence. And think about that word for a minute, within the realm of faith. There had to be some evidence that a person was actually filled with the Holy Spirit. That was an important step towards salvation. And so from the very beginning, along with the doctrine of hell being an issue that I had to wrestle with, I was literally taught, religiously taught, that God supplies evidence. That faith was not just saying, I believe there's a unicorn, whether I can show it or not. Our form of faith was, if you say there's a unicorn, and you pray hard enough, you'll get to ride that sucker out. <laughs> right? And so this idea of evidence was also plaguing me, and little did I know it was chipping away at my faith in the invisible. And so, once I had realized God loves everyone, God saves everyone, then I had to figure out what was the mechanism for that salvation. How does this work? Where is the evidence? What's the, not just biblical evidence, but, but what is the theory behind this that explains how God can actually save everyone? So the next stage that I was introduced to comes through people like Bishop Carlton Pearson that had a huge Pentecostal church, African-American Pentecostal church, and came out as saying he no longer believed in hell and lost everything literally lost everything for that one change of belief. So he had got to the cutting edge of Christianity, and he began to say, well, what we have here is the fact that actually God is in everyone, that everyone is a child of God, that everyone belongs to God, that it's really one big family. 
Now, if you, if you read my book, Hope After Faith, and you understand anything about my family and my upbringing, you'll learn that my dad was killed one month before I turned three years old. He was an alcoholic, he was a pastor's son, and he lived a very careless and, ve and very dangerous life. And he killed himself in a drunk driving accident. Now, the, the reason that I would tie all of that together is to simply say that, that very early on in my life, I was pained by separation, by division. And so this idea, God loves everyone, God saves everyone, God is really in everyone, there's one brotherhood of man, this was satisfying to me. It felt good to, to, to even gaze out upon the shopping mall and see all of these strangers and to have this, this internal sense that I was somehow connected to all of these people. That I somehow belonged to them and they belonged to me and there was no real separation, no real division, but we were all on the same side. Even if we didn't understand the same doctrine or believe the same ideas, we were all going to the same beautiful destination and we were one. That attracted me. It was called the gospel of inclusion. And it attracted me. It was a, it was a new form of universalism. Now, in my experience, what that allowed me to then do, because all of this is happening somewhat in secret, right? Because days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and months turn into a career, right? And it happens very, very quickly. And so I, I already had a place within the community, and I had a place within the religious community, and I had a young wife, and I had a young son, and we had bills just like everyone else. And so without actually consciously thinking about the threat that these ideas had to that livelihood and that security, I, I knew better than to push the envelope except for where the envelope wanted to be pushed. And so I was careful, and I studied these things on the sly. So I was thrilled to be able to finally demonstrate this brotherhood sense that I had when I was pastoring a church, a little church in De Quincey, Louisiana, and I reestablished, re-energized the Ministerial Alliance. And to be able to sit at a meeting, to sit at the table with, with ministers representing many different denominations, it was, it was a thrill. It was a thrill to create that unity and out of a pure heart to feel like just because that, that person is a Methodist, that does not necessarily mean they're going to hell. And by then I didn't believe there was a hell to go to, right? But that we were one because I'd come from, I'd come from a background that was so isolated that not only did you have to be Pentecostal in order to be saved, you had to be our version of Pentecostal. And not only did you need to do that, but in order to really be sure that you were going to be saved, you better belong to our particular church. <laughs> I'm talking about four walls and a roof, okay? And even then, we weren't exactly sure about everybody who was attending regularly. And if you didn't attend regularly, then you were out already, so it didn't matter. You might as well be Catholic because none of them are going to heaven anyway. <laughs> And so, so to be able to express myself and to feel this connection, this, this sense of grace, of giving grace to people, of being tolerant, of being accepting, it was, it was beautiful and it was rewarding to be able to have that brotherhood. God loves everyone. God saves everyone. God's in everyone. And it made ministering so beautiful because whenever the person would, would, would come into the church that because of religious traditions, they felt as if they were outsiders. Maybe they had a habit that that particular church, that particular denomination thought was sinful. To be able to step over those traditions and to be able to treat that person as, as they really deserve to be treated, as the beautiful human being they are, it was liberating. And it made me very popular. Very, very popular. And so God loves everyone. God saves everyone. God is in everyone. And then, lo and behold, while I was at the same time pursuing a little bit of a political career, I was our mayor's chief of staff and director of community services, small town, 10,000, was supposed to run for mayor next year. What do you think my chances are? <laughs> Probably not very good. So, so while I was there, I was exposed to the works of Joseph Campbell. And all of a sudden, see, I could preach if I wanted to. All of a sudden... All of a sudden, there was a, there was a viewpoint <laughs> that I had never experienced before. There was a way of taking religion seriously, but not taking it too seriously. 
There was a way to be in love with mythology, be, to, to be in love with religion, to be in love with the different, the different elements of the religious experience without being a fundamentalist. And I'd never seen that before. And so, of course, I was duly impressed with the similarities between different Messiah figures and different religions. All of that played into it. And it began to slowly dawn on me that for, the, for a good portion of the human experience, religion or supernaturalism has had a role. And it began to occur to me that, that maybe it's not that, that God loves everyone. Maybe it's not that God saves everyone. Maybe it's not that God is in everyone. Maybe, maybe God is, is just our internal dialogue. Maybe it's a byproduct of human beings wrestling with the real world, wrestling with the unknown, trying to deal with the legitimate pain and suffering that exist in the human experience, our awareness of our own ultimate demise, uh, the, the pain that we feel at the loss of a loved one. These things, of course, throughout human history would generate within Homo sapiens, this, this desire to create an answer, to find an answer. And maybe, maybe it's this internal dialogue. Well, now the train was completely off the rails. <laughs> By then, it all really changes. And I begin to move from one type of ministry to the other. And I, I found, through a long, elaborate story, I, I found a church that I thought was liberal enough that I could get in and I could explore these particular ideas, these avenues of thought. Unfortunately, I was in a desperate position whenever I tried to move, and I didn't do a thorough investigation. And they were just as conservative as everything that I'd left, other than they didn't speak in tongues. Which, of course, as you know, means they're all going to hell. <laughs> so, I will admit to you that the reason it took 25 years for me to reverse engineer the traditions of my family. The reason that it took 25 years for me to go through those phases is because I didn't want to go through those phases. And life is complicated. And, and in the beginning, when there was no internet to take advantage of, or internet that I could get a hold of to take advantage of, I would have literally every volume of the encyclopedia spread out across the floor literally like tabs open on a web browser, right? One laying in the other so that I could remember where I started. I would finish this article, close that one. That revealed the one that led me to that one. I'd read it and close that one and work my way all the way back to the original article. And what I could sense as I was reading this, because life is complicated and people are complicated, on the one hand, I would be terribly, terribly excited for the new information. I would be thrilled as, as, I was, as, as the thought was beginning to formulate in my mind as I was reading the words on whatever page it was and I could tell where they were going and what that must ultimately mean. I could, I could sense the anticipation and the excitement of reaching a new level of thought, of expanding my intellectual horizons. On one hand, I was terribly excited about it. But on the other hand, I was horrified. Not just because of what it might mean, not just because of what it might challenge me to do or the changes it might challenge me to make and the ostracism that it would most likely have in my life, which it ultimately did, but also because I came from a portion of Christianity that said, you can think too far. And if, if you think that far then literally the grace of God will be lifted from your life, from your heart, and you will be turned over to a reprobate mind. Your conscience will be seared. Your conscience will be seared as if it were by a hot iron, completely soldered closed, closed off from the presence of the Holy Spirit, and you will be subject to demonic possession. Now imagine for thinking, for reading, for exploring areas of thought, and so I came out of Christianity kicking and screaming. And it was the reason why that even after I had come to realize that, that if anything, God is this internal dialogue within us, it's the reason why that I still tried to find a way to be a Christian minister. Because I thought this duplicity that I now live under 
for a lack of better words, was my cross to bear. For reading what I shouldn't have read if I wanted to be content in that world. For knowing what I should not know if I wanted to be content in that world. I didn't know that there was another way to help people. I didn't know that there was something beyond the void. In my experience, faith alone was the only answer. Faith was it. Outside of faith, there was no hope. And I didn't know what lied beyond that. And so I wanted to continue to be a minister. I wanted to continue to try to help people. I wanted to try to, as subtly as possible, bring them to the level of freedom that I had gotten to almost. But I didn't want to bring them to a place of no hope. And so I tried everything I could. In the book, I detail the experience that catapulted me over the edge and made me realize that I was unable to stay a minister. And it was truly one of the darkest days of my life because I didn't know what else there was to be, what else there was to do. We had never made much money off of it. And I had changed denominations from time to time, so I'd already faced religious persecution a couple of different times within my life. And so it wasn't all the fear of the loss of those things, but it was the loss of the connection. It was the loss of the hope that's generated through community, being able to work together and have that feeling of one common brotherhood. Little did I know that once I broke through that barrier, once I was willing to take that step and went from God loves everyone, God saves everyone. Can you say it with me yet? <laughs> God loves everyone, God saves everyone, God's in everyone, God is everyone's internal dialogue. Once I broke through to God is a delusion. Then the possibilities opened up. I got on the computer. I quickly remembered a name of a gentleman by the name of Dan Barker. And I remembered, I remembered losing faith in faith, right? One of the first books, if not the first book that he wrote. I remembered that. I'd seen it very, very early in my ministry and, of course, wanted nothing to do with it. But I remembered it was still stuck back there somewhere. And I Googled his name and I found out that there was a world outside of this one, the one that I had been in. And for two years now, I've traveled through this world, through this secular world. And I would love to tell you that when I finished writing the book, Hope After Faith, my memoir, that I was as solid as it sounds like I am at the end of that book. But I was doing my best. But I can say now, after two years of being a humanist, I was always, always had humanistic values, but now I understand what it means to be a humanist. My little creed says, skepticism is my nature, and it always was. Free thought is my methodology, and I'm just learning all the places where my thoughts are still held captive, and I'm trying to get free in those areas. And then the third line of the creed is that agnosticism is my conclusion. After 25 years of being in the ministry, I came out with more questions than answers. And I know that there are things that I don't know. And I don't know if anybody can know them. And so agnosticism is my conclusion. After putting my whole heart into this experience called religion, I then say atheism is my opinion. My opinion is, if you could find out the answer, the answer would be no. Atheism is my opinion. But what I learned about myself, and it was the foundation of rebuilding a love for myself, was that humanism had been my motivation all along. So, <clears throat> I'm laying in a hotel bed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana several months ago after the book had come out, and I can't get to sleep because I'm supposed to be in this little uh, public broadcasting television studio like it. Six o'clock in the morning. Did you know there's a six o'clock in the morning? <laughs> this is crazy. And so I was going to have to be there, and, and I was going to be interviewed by Joe Scarborough on Morning Joe. And I was told by the producer there was going to be a Catholic priest that was going to be on the other side you know, of the table. Of course, I'm you know, coming in by satellite. And I had been asked many times, how does this happen? And I always want to say, for $25.99, you can know. <laughs> but that's not a polite answer, right? 
And so you want to say, well, there's a book. <laughs> I took the time. The publisher gave me four months, and me and my co-writer, Ethan Brown, in four months we wrote the book, and you can know the details. There's a book there, but that's, that's not a polite answer either. And so laying there in that hotel room, unable to sleep, I thought, what is the answer? What is the quickest answer I can give to these people? Because I know that's going to be the question. And of course, you know, without disappointing us, Joe, before he introduced me, made sure everyone understood exactly who he was and what he believed, because that's the new level of journal journalism in the world. Make sure everybody understands. And then he says, and we know there can't be any hope without faith, but here's Jerry DeWitt who wrote a book with that title, you know. <laughs> Basically, have you seen it? Go back and watch it. That's pretty much the way that it happened. And so they quickly get to the point. How does this happen? 25 years in the ministry. And of course, what they're wanting is, and, and I, I'm going to be facetious, but, but they're wanting me to say, well, you know, uh, my neighbor backed over my dog and I prayed and God didn't bring my dog back to life and now I'm, you know, mad at God and so I'm going to go out and write this book and try to destroy Christianity because my dog. And obviously they're thinking there's going to be some really sad story, something tragic that didn't happen. But to their surprise, because of how incredibly tall, handsome, and clever I am. <laughs> Don't know which one you're laughing at, but we'll go with it. I said, what brought me from being a believer to a non-believer was love. Love brought me. And that's really the answer. Because I wouldn't have even went into the ministry if I didn't have a love for humans. And that's the reason, as fun as it looks like it is when y'all are doing your thing, I can't beat up on preachers. Now, I don't defend the televangelist because I'm not friends, well, I'm friends with a couple, but I'm not friends with enough of them to have any statistical data to know what their lives are really like. And I'm not friends with, you know, mega church leaders. But I have lived in the homes of dozens and dozens of ministers. And I must know hundreds of ministers. And I know for a fact they love people. They love people. And no matter how much they're getting paid, now the last time I looked at a statistic, and it may be much different now, but the last time I looked, 70% uh, of the churches in America had less than 100 people in them. Now it may be totally different now. The mega church boom has really you know, changed the landscape a good bit, so it, it may be even less than that now because the mega church draws off of the smaller churches in the community. But I can tell you that at less than 100 people, you're not getting rich. And at less than 100 people, you're not making enough money that you say, oh, it's for the bling that I'm getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> going to the emergency room, and standing next to the surviving spouse as we watch the heart monitor flatline. You don't do that. You don't do that. Even for $100,000 a year, you don't feel like you're getting over on the system. Your family most definitely doesn't feel like it's winning. Whenever, as my son did, he grew up with the phone in between me and him. The worst thing ever to happen in his life was for us to get a cell phone because now even the ride back and forth to church, the ride to town, the ride literally everywhere there was a phone between the two of us because it's a life of self-sacrifice. It's a life of giving. The spouse suffers because that minister is married. Whether the minister is male or female, that minister is married to a congregation. And that minister suffers. Imagine the pain and anxiety that you have in your life because you have one family. And that one family has its own shares of troubles and it's enough to drain the life out of you. Is this child going to get off of their addiction? Is this person going to get a good report back from the doctor? Is this relationship going to survive? All the things that we worry about in this complicated experience we call life. But now as the minister, you've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 families that have all of those same issues running at the same time. And you feel each and every one of them. And so, I am absolutely persuaded that it was love, love for people that brought me to this point. 
Because every time that I could save more people, it changed me and it changed my doctrine, right? My little gospel of personal gospel of inclusion just got larger and larger and larger and it changed me and it changed me until it changed me to this. Because this is the ultimate gospel of inclusion. Because this says we are one family and that we share one world and that we share one destiny and that there is a hope that is generated among us, a hope that reaches beyond faith, a hope after faith. It was a love for humans. And not only that, it was a love for truth. And it was even a love for God. A God that looked like my grandmother. So it was love that brought me to this point. But in the last two years, that love has now grown to hope. And so I want you to ask Daniel Dennett about the clergy project. I want you to read his book. I want you to find out about us. Because the better you do, the better the community that you build the better that you step out there and you make the world aware that you exist and that there's hope after faith, that becomes something other than just a book. That becomes something more than just your personal experience. It becomes a life ring for people like me. Because had I known you at step three, then step two, then step four and five, those next two, would have happened like that. Can I get a Darwin? <laughs> Nobody, not even one? Darwin! All right, all right. So thank you. I went on much longer than I intend. I would love to entertain your questions. Please step up to the mic so they can hear it. Thank you. One of my big uh, problems is we use the word, they, Religions use the word faith far too much when we prefer to use confidence. Absolutely. Because confidence requires a certain amount of That's right. evidence. Right. And I, I hear it all the time. I, I've been listening to a lot of YouTube uh, short videos. Sure. And, uh, well, some of them not so long. <laughs> some of them longer. Right. But they, even atheists, use the word faith far too much when they should be using the word confidence. I agree. I completely and agree. I think I, we need to yeah. change that attitude. Right. And, and the word faith is used for so many different things that unless you already understand the context the person is speaking in, it's very easy to miss it because you can say, what is your faith? And they may say Baptist or Presbyterian, and now you're talking about denominations. You can say faith and be referring to confidence, and you can be speaking of faith and talking about blind faith that rejects the idea of the seen. For faith, right, is, our faith is not in those things that are seen, but those things that are not seen. You know, so that's, you're right. I, I think that's a good use of the language. I have a, have a statement that's pertinent here. Uh, you take any religion, remove the myth and the uh, supernaturalism, yeah. and all that's left is humanism. Right. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, I have two questions. One is, um, uh, do you have a developing humanist ethic that you have, uh, uh, since we all have to sort of create uh, this kind of thing for ourselves, uh, can you uh, expand on that a little bit? And the second question is, uh, what's happening with the clergy project and yeah. how many people are involved and is it growing, things yes. of that sort? Uh, that's two great questions. So let me, let me take the second one first. Um, yes, the Clergy Project has been online now for uh, two years, uh, getting very close to its third year, and we have over 500 participants in the Clergy Project. And I always like to tell that number first because everybody gets real excited. Um, and, and over a quarter of those are what we classify as actives, people who are actually standing behind pulpits or running churches in some form of, of ministry, paid ministry. And... Um, and so they're the ones that we are, are most anxious to provide emotional support for and protect. Real quick about the Clergy Project. Uh, the Clergy Project is not a transitional organization. 
It's not meant as a tool to bring people, to bring ministers to non-belief. It's not meant as a way to try to deconvert. It's not any of those things. You actually go through a vetting process. You have to be screened, and you have to prove to the screener in, in more than one way that you actually have already made that transition your own, that this is your own personal experience. You no longer believe, so, um, and that's the only way that you get in for, for multiple reasons. One, of course, is because we're trying to protect everyone who is in there, and we don't want someone who's bouncing back and forth. But from my perspective, another important reason of doing that is because there's such a high price to pay for admitting that you are a non-believing minister and what decisions that then brings about. And so we don't want to have any responsibility in that pain and suffering that is produced. We don't want someone to look back and say, well, you know, I could have went either way, but that dang Jerry DeWitt, you know, he talked me out of it and now everything's, you know, gone to hell. Um, we want to make sure this is a transition that a person has made on their own. So uh, over a quarter are, are actives, and that's, that's pretty fantastic. And in general, the demographics uh, of the clergy project look very much to the demographics of the United States. Almost every religion is, um, is, is involved, and the percentage of, of women ministers is equal to that that you would find in the United States itself. So it's pretty interesting. Now, as far as my own humanist ethics, I think I had the core principle all along but I just wasn't able to enact it. And now I'm getting better at enacting it. And I think that core principle is, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the bottom line of, of, of my ethics. And so the problem is in religion, especially modern Christianity, is that the very phrase, God loves you, and then it goes a little further, just like you are, all right, almost the God loves you anyway, all right, is, is saying that there's something inherently wrong with the individual, and in which Christian doctrine would say that there is. They, they are all infected with the original sin that has to be dealt with one way or the other. And so the problem with that is, is that if your worldview is that you don't really deserve God's love, but you're getting it because He's so awesome, right, and can love anybody, then... then it, it deteriorates your personal, your, your self-respect because you're always waking up every morning as a sinner who's only allowed to take one more breath because God's tolerating them. Once you take that out and you realize that it is, it is a true, a true privilege to be here, to experience reality to experience this phenomenal thing that we call the universe once you realize what a precious experience this is it makes you so unique because to the best of our knowledge there'll never be another you right and it makes you more precious than gold it makes you more precious than anything else when you start from that sense of self-worth and that ability to truly love yourself now you can love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that becomes important. That makes a difference to me. Yes, ma'am. I have a more personal question for you. How did your immediate family, your wife and your kids, do when you moved into non-belief? Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So, um, because my dad, because my dad um, died one month before I turned three years old, as I mentioned of the drunk driving accident, I grew up... Um, believing that he lived this careless life because he was a preacher's son. Don't know if that's true or not. That's just what I grew up believing. So when I had a son, the last thing that I wanted to do was put him in that same pressure cooker. And, and I had obviously more experiences than just this hypothesis over my dad. Being in church, being around other ministers, you know, if, if you want to go have a good time, go have it with a preacher's kid, right? You know, I mean, that's, you know. And so, so I didn't want my son to live a reckless life. I didn't want him to feel pushed because of my experience. And so, so we tried to keep that pressure off of him as much as possible. So we didn't have Bible studies with him at home. We didn't, you know, force prayer. We didn't do those things. And about uh, two years before I came out, he didn't really use the A word, 
but he started expressing his individuality, all right, like uh, in fun ways, like he stopped cutting his hair, you know, and, and he's about five inches taller than me, and, and he's just this, just this big old guy, and it looked like Thor walked in the room is what I always like to say. <laughs> And, uh, and so then he got the tattoo and he got an earring and he got things, you know, and, and it, was, it was his way without all the language to say, I'm not going this way. I'm not doing this. And, and I, I honestly, though, to be completely honest, I was, I was troubled over how people might look at me because of that. Just being honest, right? If I'm not honest about those things, you won't believe all the good things I have to say about myself. Um, but at the same time, he held a very special place because of me losing my dad so early. He, he held a very special place, and I loved him so much that I couldn't help but be proud of him for expressing his individuality in an area where what he wanted to do was completely out of sync with the rest of our community. And so I, I, I must admit I was inspired by his bravery, and I call him my hero. So he's good. He's been part of Team DeWitt and has traveled the country with me. Um, as long as we can stay in hotels. He's not crazy about staying in people's houses. <laughs> so he's not on this tour. But, um, but my wife, my wife had a totally different experience. We always referred to her as an apitheist. And uh, she was apathetic about the whole thing. Never really wanted. I, I won't be too much longer. Are you getting too tired? I apologize. No, 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 no. You're yeah. going to let him be next? Oh, okay. Um, and so, um, so she never wanted to be in the ministry. She, she was forced into our form of Pentecostalism at the age of 13. Up till then, she was able to be like every other young lady, you know, in, in her community that wasn't in that particular religion. And overnight, it had all changed. So she wasn't too crazy about it from early on. But she happened to fall in love with a Pentecostal preacher. And I mean, and who wouldn't, right? And so, so uh, y'all laugh at the wrong times. And so... Um, so, but, you know, she came along and, and basically, as you'll see in the book, I drug her around for 20 years. And she hated every bit of the public life that came from being a minister. Well, if you hated that, think how much more you would hate this. Okay, this level of publicity. I mean, our story has now been told in the New York Times twice. MSNBC, CNN, countless videos, countless, NPR, we've probably been on NPR half a dozen times, easy. I mean, so, so that level of notoriety um, was too much. And so she moved out, she left. And so she uh, left, you know, uh, obviously by logistics left us because she, she had to move completely out of the situation. So, but you know, things are working. Things are working out. Make it work. So that was both, right? So the rest of the family uh, was everything from uh, I love you anyway, which I've come to hate, to I will, I will uh, unfriend you on Facebook and pretend you don't exist and everything in between. So, sorry. I was traveling with you throughout your entire journey. Empathy, sympathy. Right. However, one thing gave me pause. It seemed to me that even through the end, when you're talking about your current state of mind, mm -hmm. you hark to saving people. Did I? I believe so. Okay. Now, what, if that is still in your mind, yeah. are you saving people from? Yeah. And from your point of view, what are your colleagues in various ministries saving people from? Yeah. Now, I've reflected on this for a long time. I have my right. own views about right. what the Eastern religions are saving people from yeah. and what the Western religions are saving people from. Right. But I don't want to... Right. Point you in his right, right, direction. Right, right. Like, no. Well, I'm glad that you did mention the difference between East and West because that's important to me. If I use that terminology, then I misused it because I don't consider myself to be saving anyone from anything. As a matter of fact, I get in a little bit of trouble in the secular movement because I think they would like and or expect me to be an atheist evangelist. Mm -hmm. And I don't go out and try to deconvert anybody. And I don't make mention of my status unless someone asks or already knows or the, or the subject matter is just right. And so I let, you know, I live and let live is, is my philosophy. And I always contribute that back to, uh, you know, when you stop growing at five foot five, you learn how to get along, you know. And that's kind of, that's kind of my philosophy with that. So, so I don't see myself as saving anyone from anything uh, through, this, through this atheistic expression. I don't see that. Or no. Humanity yeah. in general does yeah. not need to be saved or rescued I don't, I don't from see, any condition. I don't see, I don't see any uh, inherent evil or sin or wrongness 
that they might need to be saved from. I do think that, that as our culture and our society evolves, we get wiser and wiser about how we can take care of the planet and how we can treat each other as far as social justice is concerned, civil rights is concerned, and all of those issues, of course, are tightly interwoven in religious philosophy. And so if, if, if that was saving people, well then I'd be very interested in seeing the United States in particular become more secular in its politics, not necessarily more secular in its, in its religion, but more secular in its politics so that civil rights, this is the last civil right, or at least the current one, right? And it's about the right to think what you want to think. And that's a big issue. So that would be as close as I could get to saving anyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. But Eastern philosophy definitely, definitely has something. <laughs> definitely has something about learning how to be content. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the interest that I have in uh, many respects is how to deal with the population or the subset of our population that are among the, they're defined as the nuns. Yes. Yeah. It seems like most of those people have gone through somewhat the process that you have in your life. Right. I know I have in my life. Right. And we come to a point where we say, well, I just can't deal with that religion thing. Mm -hmm. And they go into kind of a nothingness. Right. So how would you address the 25-year-old who has decided I'm a nun and mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with any of this. Right. And uh, I need to, to know what to do next. So right. That's a, that's, a, that's a fair question. And... and, and not in any way trying to be evasive. I think it, it depends on the 25 year old. It depends on the conversation. It depends on a lot of things. But if we're gonna generalize, um, I, I need to go back and I need, I need to really look at the research that's been done. Because I hear conflicting numbers, I hear conflicting ideas about who is represented in these groups. Um, it seems, the latest that I heard was that out of the 20%, out of the one in five, only about 4% of those actually classify themselves as atheists. Okay, so we know where they're at, we know what they're doing. The other 16%, if they, if they carry themselves, if they consider themselves to not be religious, what I would like to say to all of my secular family members is, that don't mean nothing. Them saying they're not religious doesn't mean anything because that word religious for a lack of better phraseology, that word religious has been demonized by modern Christianity. Christianity, through the evangelical movement, uh, and particularly with the charismatic influences, for decades now has been telling people being religious will take you to hell if you're religious. Because in their minds, what religious means is that you are um, habitually following a set of guidelines, that you are just getting up and without any mindfulness, without any devotion, you're just driving to church on Sundays because mom and daddy went to church on Sundays, and that makes you religious. You're, you're religious, okay? The same way we would say uh, he jogs every day religiously, all right? So that very word, just like the first question that dealt with faith, the word faith has been abused. The word religious has been abused. And so when a person is filling out this survey, and they say they're not religious and they don't want to be associated with any religious affiliation, that doesn't say anything about whether or not they're a supernaturalist. More than likely, they are still a spiritualist. They're still wrapped up in some form of mysticism and don't yet, and, and have not, they haven't grasped that there are answers beyond mythology for our condition. Um, and because they haven't grasped that yet, they're stuck back here with mythology thinking that's the only answers that are involved, but they don't want to get up and go to Sunday school, okay? And, and from a pastor's perspective, you know, I, I would say I think we have 4% atheist and 16% lazy <laughs> is what I would think. And so I think, I, think this, I think we have to be careful with those things. So if he is truly, I don't want nothing to do with religion, um, what I would first do, and I know this is going to sound very Christianese, I would express good humanistic values to him, 
Okay, I would show there are answers. There is still the beautiful and, and majestic sense of awe over nature. All of the things that you think you can only get out of religion, you really can get out of humanism, out of naturalism, right? There are great missions like saving the planet that still exist. And so I would share those things with him to captivate his attention and show there is another way of going. Is that good? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite sayings is, um, Jesus, please save me from your followers. <laughs> right, yeah. right, 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 right. Um, I spent six and a half years in a cultish kind of Pentecostal church. They go by the door, La Puerta, Victory Chapel in New okay. England. Sure. And I was in a spot when I was 21. I was like an up and outer. Um, it's love bombing. You right. know, I wanted a sense of community. Right. But how do you feel today when you hear the music that you associated with 25 yeah. years, are you fond of it or yes. do you have like regret or um, how do you feel for people that are really wrapped up? You know, yeah. I went to church many times a week. I was in this music ministry. It was really sort of like when God becomes a drug. It, it absolutely is a drug and Pentecostalism is, is um, I'm not saying that it's designed because that speaks as if there's one person set back and figured it all out. It evolved into something that is very, very addictive for the participant. So first off, the music, absolutely love the music. Still love it, still love to hear it, still can sing it, and it doesn't offend my conscience. It doesn't bother me. Obviously, I'm not going to go sing it up on the platform at church because then that would bother me because I would be misleading people you know, in my mind, but I still love it. I still absolutely love the music, I love the environment, I love the emotion, and I miss it. I love it and miss all of those things. Um, so, so then the next part is related to, we've talked about music and then people, how I feel about people uh, that are wrapped up in it. The people that are wrapped up in it, I actually feel sorry for. You know, Now, I've got a live and let live attitude towards it, but at the same time, I feel very sorry for them because I know that they have potential that will forever be untapped because of the regulation that exists within that particular, you know, mindset. It seemed like there was a third. It seemed like that was the first and there was a third. Can you remember what it was? Oh, I could go on and on. Oh, okay. I haven't written my book yet. <laughs> yeah. But um, when we got out of this movement in New England, there were 400 people and the older people that actually made money and thought about 40 of us left at one time. That was a big deal. Right. These were the established people. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought there. But to me I could write season. I could write my own book. Oh, some people said, you know, you should become a thought reform specialist. Uh, and there was a guy named Steve Hassan who's written books they used to deprogram people. I remember that, sure. No, you can't kidnap people anymore. Right. And sometimes I feel that that legalism is just another form of slavery. Right. And this is just for the record. I'm sorry to monopolize the, you know, the microphone, but um <clears throat> I feel like you know, I want to snatch people from, it's this form of slavery. Sure, it, it absolutely is. I agree. Thanks. I agree. Thank you. Write your book. That's how we do things. That's how we, that's how we have one more thing out there for the 25-year-old to stumble across. That's good. I guess my question ends up being kind of related to that, uh, although I'd started from a different place. So you were a Pentecostal uh, minister, uh, raised, I presume you did missionary work, calling people into your uh, denomination, um, into, your, into your particular church, right. and now you're a humanist. Do yeah. you find yourself in the same spot? Right. That, real quick, that reminds me of the second of her three, of her three points, which was, do I feel any regret? And I like, I like to be straightforward about this, and that ties back into okay. to, to your question. Um, I, I, I don't feel the regret that I hear some people express, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And it is because even though every time I made a change to my doctrine, I didn't immediately run to the nearest pulpit and blab it all out in detail, I still would attempt to put that into what was going on. I would stop saying what I didn't believe, like, you know, like the moment that I was convinced there was not a hell, well, of course, I never preached on hell again. Now, I didn't get up and say, hey, guess what, everybody? I just figured out there's not a hell because I tried that with my grandmother, and it didn't work very well at all. <laughs> um, and, but yet, you know, so, so, so the duplicity eventually became that no matter, no matter what I would get up and say, people would go home and add to it just because I was associated with the church, with the group. 
And so I could get up and preach nothing but love your neighbors yourself for 50 times in a row, but when they saw a charismatic preacher on TV say there's a hell, they immediately associated that I must believe there's a hell as well or whatever the junk thing was. They, you know, they wrap it all up in their mind and eventually that became too much of a burden. But I, I, don't feel, I don't feel a sense of regret in that way. Maybe, no, maybe I do feel regret but not guilt. Okay, about that, because I was doing the best I could at the time. One of the advice, pieces of advice I gave, especially towards the end of my ministry when I was counseling, was uh, you don't have the right. The you of today does not have the right to judge the you of yesterday because there's more information. There's more stuff going on in your life. You just you don't have the right to do that. And so I don't feel that, that guilt, and another reason I don't think I do is because we constantly paid a price for making those moves. You know, we would tear up what we might would have built for weeks or months or years to reestablish on this new foundation. And then I would evolve out of that and we'd tear that up again. And so we stayed in constant poverty and constantly on the move. And so I feel like we kind of paid a price for honesty all along the way. So now, say your little, your little part one more time. Uh, missionary. Missionary. So I was a horrible evangelist. Oh. Horrible. And that's what we called it in Pentecostalism was evangelist because the word missionary had already been used, you know, and so you have to do it around. Um, I was horrible, and I think I'm a horrible missionary for atheism. You know, all I can do is tell my story and then, and then talk about how complicated this is. You know, and in order to be a good evangelist, a good missionary, you have to make it simple for the person to go from one step to the next. And I don't emphasize the simplicity of it. I emphasize the complexity of it. You know, and that's what makes me a perfect bridge to have, say, like in January uh, of next year, obviously, on the 11th in D.C., we're going to have this common ground conversation. Be Secular is sponsoring it, and it's where we're going to start these dialogues with the very liberal Christian left. Because to me, this is complicated. It's not as simple as let's build a wall. They can live over there, and we'll live over here, and we'll bring them over one at a time. We've got to figure out how to get along. So I wasn't very good at it, and not very good at it now. Yes, <laughs> I have another question, though. Uh, you was, said you were a minister for 25 years. Yes. So as a, there are a number of different contradictions in the Bible. Yes. How would you go explaining these things and making it, you know, trying to basically for, uh, make up excuses, I guess, for yeah. why to accept it? If, I mean, if there's all this negative, all the, all the cruelty in there, and right. all the contradictions. Absolutely. Those are, those are two separate issues in, in, in my way of thinking, the contradictions and the cruelty. Um, the contradictions for years, years and years and years, as I would come across contradictions, and, and believe it or not, if you're, if you're in the right religious frame of mind, they hide from you really, really well. <laughs> I mean, they really, really do. You'd be surprised that you can read the Bible attentively read the Bible all the way through and not see them because of your mindset. And so, so there was obviously a time I didn't see them, but as I began to see them, uh, for years I felt as if there was an answer, that, that I was misunderstanding something, that there was a way that they do fit together, but I just can't quite see it. And that becomes part of, part of your spiritual quest. That becomes part of your faith using you know, uh, the same terminologies where you're trying to live a life of study and dedication and prayer to make sense of these issues. That if you get close enough to God, God will then reveal to you how all these pieces fit together. And trust me, you can do that for years if you're in that frame of mind. As far as cruelty, um, as much as I try to bridge, build a bridge between myself and Christians, between myself and liberal Christians anyway, um, I will say that that to, from my experience, Christianity, especially in its modern form, is actually a very, very self-centered religion, very self-centered. And that shouldn't be too terribly surprising because Christianity um, came about towards the end of the Axel Age when all of religious philosophy began to say, well, what does this mean to me? All right. Up until then, you had cosmic maintenance, and the charismatics have brought cosmic maintenance back, but that's a different story, um, to where it was like, well, how can, what can we do to please God in order to have the harvest saved you know, or to have the harvest bountiful? Then it kind of changed, and it became, what does this mean to me? How does this relate to me personally? So many of the cruelties in the Bible are excused through the apologetic explanations that say, this was necessary in order 
for you to be saved. Okay? And so when you're reading that and you see, you see the flood and you see that all of humanity is wiped out very cruelly except for what's on the boat, there's a justification that's already built in in your mind that as sad as that is, it was necessary to wipe sin off the planet so that eventually through this very long detailed set of circumstances, eventually Christ could be born and Christ could be your Savior. And you can be just selfish enough to swallow it. That's a fact, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Another follow-up question to that, I guess coming from an anthropological background, yeah. is how would you able to counter the scientific data that shows up about evolution? Obviously, the flood yeah. is... Yeah, and it's, all these all, other it's all the same thing I just explained. It's done the exact same way. And, and, and so many people, so many people within Christianity would actually say, what evidence? What evidence? They, they're, they're, not reading, they're not reading about evolution. They're not reading, um, they're not reading anything related to anthropology. They're, they're not reading any of those things, so they don't know any of that evidence. And many times, the only thing they're watching, if they're watching what you would think would be journalism in some type of news channel, then it's going to give out the party line so that those kind of you know, challenging thoughts aren't introduced into their minds. And so I was able to go an extremely long length of time in my life without any challenge by evolution, without any challenge of natural history, none whatsoever. And when it would come up, you have specialists within every denomination that are able to, before people are exposed to what we would consider to be the facts, they're first exposed to the rebuttal. The rebuttal comes first, and that gets set in the mind, and then whatever you say, they've already been trained to not only hear but to respond to. Back to slavery, like was mentioned earlier. Well, evidently, uh, you have been all over the country yes. and have talked to a great many groups like this one. Yes. And have found yourself as a humanist. Yes. And an atheist, of sure. course. And agnostic, uh, and skeptic, and, and, and on and it goes. Yeah. <laughs> but in your encounters uh, with groups like this one... Yours uh, is absolutely the best. Oh, of course. <laughs> there could be no doubt of that whatsoever. <laughs> but in any case, what sort of advice would you give mm. to the humanist and atheist movements throughout the country? Because we are struggling. We are a growing group. But yet we are struggling with finding our identity and finding a mission and a purpose. We, we, we have a general idea of the direction which we're going, but there are uh, many competing um, notions about directions in which to go. Right. What, what would your observations seem to suggest? Wow. <laughs> you know, you heard the part about me only being here for two years, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, the first thing that, that I would makes it valuable. is that one makes it valuable. Yes. Oh, that's right. kind of cool that you say that. Go, please, buy the book, Hope After Faith. I've already been to uh, one of the bookstores. They are carrying it in Tampa, so please go get it. And, uh, and, and so I wish I had some. I sold them all before I got here, oh. the ones I had in the car with me. I apologize. Um, but it's, it's kind of neat that you say that because I've got this great story about traveling to see a particular minister in a particular part of the country because... Of, of that very thing. I was so new to his particular doctrine, so he thought my advice would be better. Um, the first thing that I would say to the secular movement is don't believe your own press. <coughs> don't believe your own press. Don't get hyped up about yourself because we have tunnel vision. We're, 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 we're now, because of the power of social media, we're able to live within our own box and we're able to see our own tweets, tweets just from our own folks, right? And our own post, and our own numbers, and our own statistics, and our own language, and our own everything. Don't believe your own press. Try to step out from the secular movement and be very aware that we are still an extremely, extremely small, as far as organized is concerned, an extremely, extremely small part of what's going on. And I think, I think that's important because if we don't pay attention to that, then um, we're liable to overestimate our reach and overestimate our abilities. The next thing that I would say very quickly, these are both still kind of personal, is um, be very careful about motivation. Because 
I don't see religion as something that some guy built over there and then invited everybody to. I see religion as just a byproduct of human nature. And then stepping back from it, we call it religion, right? You know, just like, um, just like I think Joseph Campbell said, uh, mythology is what you call other people's religion, right? <clears throat> well, I think religion is what we call everything but us. <laughs> And we're still very religious in many ways. We still, have, we still have forms of thinking that we get rutted into. We still, have, we still have things that we have to deal with. For instance, and since I'm at the end of not just this tour, but my touring, I've been adding to these questions that, um, that I think we're, we're moving towards creating our own denominations. And who knows what time will tell. Maybe that would be a good thing. Maybe it would be a bad thing. But we criticize religion about it. But yet we have the same thing. And nobody starts out to create their own denomination. Instead, they say, I think I've got this figured out a little bit better than the other guy. Let me go get my own 501c3. <laughs> and then 100 years later, you look back and say, damn, that's where that denomination started. <laughs> right there. And, and that's what we're going to do because this is human nature. And so what I would say to the secular movement as a whole that we should do is that we should, I, I'll just reiterate because I think it's the best, we should always be very sensitive to our motivations. What are our motivations? Why are we doing what we're doing? And I'm still very much a believer in love, and I think if we will continue to let love be our motivating factor, then no matter which way we split up and go and what happens, I think we'll be okay. But as far as technical strategies, I don't have the answer. All I know is, is I've got a job, and I'm going home. <laughs> yes, sir. Right, right along those lines, actually, right. uh, going from a, a, a sense of deep community for 25 years, right. uh, what do you do to replace that? There's, there's a big void that is created by, by moving away from that community. Right. My experience is not fair. My experience is not fair because, yes, I was dreading the loss of community. I could see that if I made those, that last step that I'd be completely separated from the community I'd been in and I had no idea there was another one. Because very quickly the story, you know, it was sensational and it became sensationalized and got everywhere. People flocked to me. So my global family grew literally globally overnight. And so I have not in any way felt disconnected. Um, now obviously it doesn't replace kin. It doesn't replace the, the family members that I've lost. And it's always going to be a little more difficult for, for the secular family to truly 100% replace the religious family, primarily because I had them for so long. But I have been, I have just, I've, I've swam in love and appreciation for the last two years. Thousands upon thousands of, of people connecting with me through Facebook or Twitter. Now, that's why I say my situation is not fair. So what I say to people who are fortunate enough that they're not going to end up in, New, in the New York Times, because I promise you, having your name in the New York Times plus 50 cents gets you what? A cup of coffee. A cup of coffee. That's exactly right. Thank you. And so I guess it's 75 cents now. I don't know what it is. But um, so, so what I say to people is, is that they really need to take that extra effort and to find some type of group somewhere and hopefully they will organically build the friendships and relationships that can, can make the difference. But we're still, we're still figuring out how to do this. We really are. Thank you. You touched on a point I, wanna, I, want, I want you to comment a little bit further on and also one of the other people that asked the question. When I looked up the organization to try to find out where this meeting was, uh -huh. I typed in atheist and something came up like atheist holy days. And I thought, huh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. something seems amiss here. Yeah, right, right. And, and the observation has been as you, the longer you've talked, I've gotten this observation that somehow the atheist now uh, nothing more than you painting an old car and calling it new. <laughs> and, and I say that in the sense that yeah. you brought all of the old religious stuff with you. Now you're mm -hmm. talking about recruiting. Some people are talking about recruiting. Some people mm -hmm. are talking about dialogue. And when in reality, if all of this is true as we think it is, yeah. that nothing mystical happens out in, 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 in there, you don't need God and all right. that, right. what's the point of having the group? Right. When yeah. if you do 
yourself mm -hmm. and just be yourself and, and, and work from that angle, then you'll just meet people like this right. and move on. Why do you yeah. need this group? Yeah. Which, sure. which, is, which yeah. is the Pepsi yeah. to the Coke. Yeah, I can tell you two things. Two things. Um, I, I don't think, I think it's fair that you compare it Pepsi to Coke. And the reason I think it's fair that you do that is because I think if we've committed any era, and obviously as human beings we've probably committed many as a social movement, the one era that I feel we've committed is that we have, we've said religion so generally that instead of focusing on supernaturalism, we have now made it sound as if we're also talking about the fact that there's a building and buildings represent religion and having a meeting represents religion and people gathering and listening to a lecture, that just, that's just like religion. So we've done this so broadly that I think it does create a certain amount of confusion because what we're really pushing against is, is supernaturalism. Not against the fact that people come together as organizations, build buildings, and do things. So the two answers of why do this, number one is personality, because there's different types of personality. I've met many atheists that they say, I don't need any of this, don't want any of this, why do you do it? They always have that same question, because it doesn't fit them as far as their personality. The other thing I would say is, is politics. Because the other side of the question is being answered through political legislation. And if we don't somehow bring ourselves together as a, voting booth, uh, as a voting block, then the civil rights that we're trying to uh, see promoted within our country are far less likely to be promoted because they're still going to play the organization game. So they started the organization game. Now we have to join into it. So that's my. So we got five minutes, which is probably now down to. Uh, it's down to four. Oh, good. I thought it'd be down to two. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Jerry, uh, I applaud your bravery. I'd Thank like you. to ask you about some others that had a change of heart in mind, uh, two men and one woman. I'm glad you brought up Bishop Carlton Pierce. Yes. Uh, he bravely shed his followers, but he regained a new following. He did? Uh, yeah, he did. He landed on his feet. I heard oh, him. I know. I know him very well. I, I yeah. talked to him. Yeah, I wonder rarely. how many of his uh, people yeah. grew along with him. You know, that would yeah. be... And, and another guy is the Pope. Uh, he's man of the year now. He's speaking very <laughs> critical. I wonder who, how many are yeah. going to come along with him for the ride, if you can yeah. speak to that. Or on the third one is a woman. Uh, uh, my, what are your thoughts on Oprah's journey? I mean, my family, uh, the fundamental Christians that praised her, and now they're not so sure. You know, right. So, so what was her journey like? I don't know her journey, yeah. but maybe if you yeah. have any insights on any of these people, that would be Yeah, great. well, um, I don't know enough about the Pope. I know that uh, I would have rather been voted sexiest man alive instead of, you know, the man of the year. Uh, probably he might would have too, so I can't speak to that as well. Um, but as far as Carlton Pearson, and of course I don't know Oprah, but I do know Bishop Pearson. I know him personally. I've been in his home. And he is an incredibly beautiful and authentic person. And it so happens that, that I followed him all the way, as I detailed earlier, through steps one, two, and three. I, I mean, literally, it was his ministry that I was following that took me those directions. And life, it, life is complicated. And where life steered me in one direction, uh, life steered him in a completely different direction. He ended up with a he ended up with another opportunity to minister in Chicago. He left Tulsa, Oklahoma, had another opportunity in Chicago, and that that just kind of, in my opinion, um, stalled the process just a little bit. Or that maybe that's not fair because he's incredibly, incredibly intelligent. It, it just took him in a different direction. I mean, literally on Facebook, if you follow me often enough, you will see me post on one of his posts, and I'll say, "I love you, Papa." I mean, he, I, I, I dearly, dearly love this man. Life just took us in two different directions. But I thoroughly respect their path for two reasons. One, I know how hard it is to go along that path. You know, I mean, there's different times that Oprah said things that could have just as easily took her off the air as, you know, in larger base. So I respect that. And I also uh, respect the fact that I don't, I don't, I'm not so sure that they hurt us politically. I think we're all on the same side as them politically, and that means a lot to me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. It's our pleasure. <laughs> all right. And this concludes our, our, our programming. And uh, thank you as an audience. You have had magnificent questions and good manners. And <laughs> thank you very much. Give yourselves a warm applause.
Atheists of Florida presents the Atheist Forum.